So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about money. We've already locked the doors. Um, I, I, we're talking about money these, these two weeks together, mostly because you're talking about money. I mean, you're thinking about money. God talks a lot about money. And, and I think it's just worth noting, when we talk about money in places like this, uh, there's a lot of emotions that, that rise to the surface. I mean, already some of your hearts are beating and there's fear, there's anxiety, there's a, a, a potential for, uh, you, you kind of have a, a, a panic attack about post or pre-church uh, experiences. And, and with that comes this, this sort of dialogue where you're like, you know, here, here we go again. You know, I haven't been in church in 12 years. And, and when I left, they were talking about money. And then here I am back again. And the pastor is talking about money. And, you know, I, I, just, I just don't, I don't, I don't know. I got, I got bills to pay. And I got student loans to pay off. And rent just went up. And, and you know, now this guy's trying to guilt me into giving. Um, and then there, another emotion that I find to be preeminent around the church these days is really suspicion. And this is, is grounded in, in the, the idea or the question of, like, can the church be trusted? And rightfully so, that's a good question because you look at scandals all over the place. I mean, in, I mean, it just feels like these are multiplying in nature and you, you got pastors like me, I'm just regular guys wearing $500 tennis shoes. Uh, there's a, an Instagram called Preachers and Sneakers just to like to highlight the scoundrels that like take, take money from the church and buy, you know, $500 tennis shoes. Uh, or pastors driving luxurious cars or, you know, uh, they own their own private jets. Like it's, it's gross. And so you, you can, it's a, it's a real question to say, can the church be trusted? And then, you know, like I watched this video on YouTube and, and, and they're like, you don't even have to give money to the church. You can just give it to a not-for-profit. And so there's lots of real emotions. And then there's a, a whole category of people that honestly have, have legitimate questions around money. Questions like, what is tithing? And is tithing a thing? And can I spread my tithe out between the church and, and the Red Cross? And like, why don't we just give our money to the poor the way Jesus did? Or did Jesus do that? And so what I want to do these next few minutes, really these next two weeks, is I want to, want to tease this out from Scripture. But b- before we do this, I want, to, I want to set a little bit of a foundation for us, just so you know my motive and, and really what we're after these next two weeks. And some of you are already like, I'm planning not to be here next week. Um, but, but I just want to warn you because like my, my heart is like discipleship. My, my heart is to, f- to help you get formed into the image of Jesus. But two big ideas that we're, we're operating from, that I'm operating from as we look at Scripture today. You can jot these down if it's helpful for you. The first big idea is that giving is central it's not incidental to your spiritual formation. Meaning God, this is not a fire sale. God, God's not like just doing his best to like raise money for the church. No, God is designing to, through giving, to help raise you up into the image of the Son. And he does that through the discipline and through the joy of giving. The second big idea, and I'm just telling you these because we're then gonna tease these out. Second big idea is that giving is central to your maturity as a Christian, meaning you, you will never grow past your unwillingness to give or your unwillingness to, to surrender what God has put in, in your hands. This is why we need a robust theology of money and a robust theology of, of giving because you are not justified, meaning you're not made right with God by, by what you give. So you can be a Christian. Let me, I'll just kind of, I'll just, I'll set the, the release valve. You can be a Christian and never give, but you'll never be a mature Christian if you don't learn to give faithfully, unless you learn to surrender all that you are and to learn to be mature in your generosity, okay? Uh, this, this is relevant for me, because you know, I've got grown kids, I mean, look, literally, they're out of the house on their own. And I think about them because they're now, they're managing their own money. And, and I, I just think about them going out with their friends and they're at dinner and, and I'm, I'm hoping, because they're, they're, gener- they're, they're generous children, or, uh, they're my children. They're always going to be my children. But they're, they're out of dinner. And I, I just imagine sometimes they're out of dinner with friends and they pick up the tab. You ever do that? You pick up the tab. And, and I, I just imagine when they pick up the tab sometimes at dinner, I, in their mind, whether they're, they're verbalizing this, they're like, I need a theology of money. 
Like we all need a theology of money and, and it's heads up. There's, there's some bad theology of money. Okay. Do you guys know that there's a, a scarcity theology that says God's afraid of money and you should be afraid of money. And then there's a, a prosperity theology that just says every Christian is meant to be rich and famous. And usually the people peddling that garbage, they're using you to get rich and, and famous. Right. And so lot, lots of bad theology, but listen, we can open up the scriptures. We can just read it plainly and be like, there's good theology. There's a good framework for how we're to handle our money, how, how we're designed to be a giving, a generous kind of people. What I wanna do for these next few minutes is I wanna do a little bit of a, uh, a deep dive on the church at Corinth. And so if, you, if you're able to, to uh, go to 2 Corinthians chapter eight, that's what Amy read a few minutes ago, and we're gonna do a quick overview of this. Uh, let me give you a little context as, as you're turning there, 2 Corinthians 8. If you're new to the Bible, welcome. Uh, 2 Corinthians is in the New Testament, so that's like the second half of the Bible. And uh, the guy writing this is a guy named Paul, the Apostle Paul. And he's writing this to this, this church in Corinth. And he, he's asking them to give an offering, a significant offering to the impoverished church in Jerusalem. And what we find out is they start to give, they start to take up the offering and then something happens. We don't know what happens, uh, but they never fulfill their commitment. And then the Macedonian church, which is their neighbor, they hear about this gap that the Corinthian church had created by not giving. And so they step in and they have this massive expression of generosity, it's beautiful. And Paul is blown away by their generosity and he uses their generosity as a teaching moment for the Corinthian church. He's like, this is what giving looks like. Now, the, hopefully the question that is coming up for you is what was going on in Jerusalem? Like why, why did they need the money? And what, what you may not know, or you may know, is that at this time the church in Jerusalem is swelling. I mean, thousands and thousands, like almost, almost overnight, there are thousands of brand new converts, brand new Christians. And so you can imagine lots of need in Jerusalem, so much so that the guys like Barnabas, who was a, an early church leader in the church, he, uh, it's recorded that he sells a piece of property and he brings all the proceeds and lays them at the apostles' feet. In fact, in Acts, it's recorded that the people did not consider any of their possessions to be their own, their own, because they're so caught up in this this uh, this wave of generosity and giving. It's beautiful, and so the Macedonians. Uh, they, they see the need, they hear about the need, and they step in. There's this, this gap, and they're like, what a privilege for us to do this. Now, the, the reason that this is, this is such a big deal and, and why Paul highlights them is to know the Macedonians. The Macedonian region, okay, so it's, it's really a region. It's not a church. The Macedonian region's in Greece, like Corinth. They're in Greece, but this is a, like a really impoverished, war-torn part of the world at this time. And so they're, they're literally giving out of their own poverty. And so the Macedonians who are Gentiles, they're like Paul. I mean, we are so privileged to be able to give to our Hebrew brothers and sisters. And the reason, because they're like, if, if we didn't know, we'd, we'd be crushed because they were the ones, the, these, these Jewish men and women that came to faith in Christ, they were the ones that gave us the gospel. I mean, we, we would not have eternal life if we didn't hear it from them. And so Paul, if there's any way for us to, to help meet their needs, their physical needs, because they have helped meet our spiritual needs. We have eternal life and we have a relationship with Jesus because of what they've given us. Now, that, that's a lot of context, okay? But what Paul's gonna do is he's, he's writing them these, these 15 verses, this letter, and he's embedding some really big ideas. Now, we don't have time to, to hit all the ideas, but I'm just gonna give you two or three today. First idea that Paul is, is really, he, he wants them, he wants to provoke their heart to this. The first is he, he wants them to have a vision for giving. I mean, clearly, that's what we're talking about. Look at verse seven. He says, but since you excel in everything, remember the Corinthian church, if, if you don't know, they're, they're like really gifted. They have lots of resources. Things are going really well for them. So since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So heads up, 2 Corinthians, if you've never read the letter, it's heavy. It's a heavy letter. It's got a lot of edges. 
It's filled with lots of correction, both first and second Corinthians, lots of correction. And, and just know, like Paul, Paul is a real person. He's coming under like heavy criticism at the time. He, he is being compared to what's called the super apostles. And, and so he's got a little, if you read it, he's got a little imposter syndrome going on. And at the same time, he, he is leading the charge on this church discipline case where this guy is having sex with his stepmom. So lots going on in the church. And at the very same time, Paul is, is encouraging the church. He's like, listen, guys, in spite of all that's going on here, there are so many areas that you're growing in. I mean, so you're growing in maturity in these areas. And what I want to do is I want to test that maturity now in the area of giving. So he says, what's the verse? He says, since you excel in everything, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So Paul, what, he, what he's not doing, he's not going, guys, listen, this is about cash. He's not about cash. And for us, the reason I talk about giving a couple times a year is never about cash. I mean, our needs are being met. We're, we're able to do ministry. And so Paul's like, the, the goal here is not to get cash. The goal is not to get people to, to drop a bigger check in the bucket or just Venmo the church. He, he's like, no, I, I want you to get a vision that this life is not about you. That you're in partnership with the God of the universe that has a vision for the redemption of people and his glory to be spread out like, the, like water over the earth. And so, in fact, when, when Paul goes on in, in other places, because he does talk about this in other places, when he talks about giving and he talks about taking up offerings, he's constantly widening this vision. In fact, I, I've made a, a quick chart for you. The offering is a, a logia, it's a collection. A eulogy, it's a blessing. Koinonia, it's fellowship, sharing, partnering. Charis, it's an expression of grace. So Paul's like, listen, guys, this is not about cash. This is about giving you the opportunity to be in a partnership, in a collection, in a blessing, fellowship, and the grace in the lives of other people. So he says, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. So here's what I know. Uh, when you came to faith, if, if, you're, if you're a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus, and I, I know some of you are not, if, when you came to faith in Jesus, we were like, Jesus is King, Jesus is Lord, he saved me, rescued me. Um, I would imagine there was at least some loose discipleship, meaning ho hopefully somebody came alongside you and said, hey, now that you're a new Christian, uh, you know, you, to follow Jesus, you can't do this by, your, by yourself. Like you can't learn how to follow Jesus in a vacuum. So some other people came alongside and were like, hey, here's how to read the Bible right? Here's how you hear from God. Here's how you pray. Here's how you share the gospel, right? You get in, in a discipleship. Here, here's what I find. This is tragic, is that the vast majority of you've never had any kind of discipleship relationship or any kind of real teaching on giving, on, on what it means to be a person living out of a heart of gospel generosity. So let, let me do this. I'm just going to step away this, from this here for a second, okay? I'm just going to, this is going to be a real talk now, Okay. <laughs> Can, I, can we do just real talk? Just I'm just gonna, I best I can. My vision's not great. Can I look in your eyes? Okay. And listen, I don't feel any tension right now. I don't. Maybe you do. I, I don't feel any tension in the room. I, there is not a, a manipulative bone in my body just this moment. I promise. We're not taking up an offering. At, we don't take up an offering. I don't know if you know. Like, there was no buckets that were passed. Like, so I just want you to know, there, there's nothing I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to pull a lever to get you to do something, but here's, I want to just talk straight with you as if you're a part of our house. On one hand, Hope City is a very generous people. I mean, I think last year uh, we had, a, I brought to you, a, there was a church in our city that their building got blown away by a tornado. And we're not in close relationship with this church. We're not even in proximity. They're in Moundville. Uh, but they're a gospel church, and, and we, we said, w wouldn't it be amazing if we could make a significant contribution to their rebuilding? They didn't have insurance. And so on a Sunday, I just brought this to you. Wouldn't this be amazing? Can, can we stir up generosity in our house? And that day, we gave $30,000 to that church. And that, that was such a high water mark for us. We were so encouraged. We were, so, we were blown away by the heart of generosity in, in, in our house. At the very same time, every year, and you, you may not know this, every year our elders, our pastors, our staff, we have to put together a, a, a yearly operating budget. 
I, I know you probably think maybe we, we get funded by some, you know, Illuminati organization in Sweden. Uh, but but we, we, every year, we have to put together a, a, an operating budget. And the way that we do that, we don't, we don't even look at the high water marks of generosity because, like, and those are beautiful and we celebrate those, but we have to look at the, the ways that people are, are faithfully giving out of, out of a gospel maturity. And here, here's, here's where we are, just so, just so you'll know. Uh, the national average for people that give, so, so this is people that would say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Jesus person, and we recognize, not everybody that comes to church is a Christian, not, not everybody would say, I, I'm following Jesus. There's lots of people that come uh, to our gatherings, they're just investigating. But the national average, those that would say, I'm a Jesus person, like he's king, and uh, this is, I, I'm part of a local church. Those two are, are important. The national average for giving, and, and the way the national average is made is by the way all averages are made. You take the highest national average, so people giving millions of dollars versus people that give $25 a year. And the way that they find that mean is by combining those two. And the national average in America is that a Christian gives $2,500 a year. So for an adult. So that would mean every adult in here, you would give $2,500 a year. Now we, we fall squarely and, and disappointingly into that national average. And so how that works for us is that uh, less than half, if, if we just wanna talk brass tax for our house, that means that less than 50% of, of the people in our community, the adults in our community, are, are giving a, a substantial, faithful gift, a tithe, okay? And again, we, we can't measure tithe. We don't know what people's income are. But less than 50% of people say, I'm, I'm faithful in supporting the mission of the gospel as part of a lighthouse here at Hub City. And then over 50% of the people in our house don't, don't really give anything. I mean, outside of what's called a, a pocket gift, and this is where maybe your heartstrings get... get uh, uh, you know, plucked and, and we're like, this, this church got blown down or the apartment complex burned down on Easter. And, and some of you that never give, you're like, oh, I'm gonna give a hundred dollars or I'm gonna give $25 or you, you go to an encounter night and, and the spirit of God comes and you're like, it inspires you to give $25. Um, I just want you to know that that's where we are. 50% or less than 50% of our church are saying, I, I believe in the vision of the gospel. And God's provoked my heart to move in that way. Then the other 50% say I'm not. Now, I, I tell you that, again, no guilt. I promise, no guilt. Though I'm about to murder this thing. <laughs> no guilt, no manipulation. But my, my hope is to provoke you the way that the Apostle Paul is, desi is designed or trying to provoke the Corinthian church. I wanna provoke your heart to catch a vision for how big God's vision is for the world and for the local church. Let me say it this way. You, your life is not designed to be a microscope. Do you know what a microscope does? A microscope makes small things big. Your life, my life is designed to be a telescope. And so the people out there that do not know Jesus, they see God as a speck in the sky. But when you and I surrender our lives, including our resources, we become a telescope so that they look through it and realize he is a cosmos. And he's worth giving our lives to. So Paul wants you and I and the Corinthians have a vision for giving. Secondly, he, he's giving us a Godward view of giving as well. And I love this so much. Look at verse five. It says, and they exceeded our expectations. Talking about the Macedonians. They exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, again, because they gave out of their poverty. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord. And then, by the will of God, also to us. So Tim Keller, who's one of my favorite authors and he was a, a pastor in New York City. He's recently passed away. But he, Tim Keller loved to say there are three primary ways people think about economic systems in the world. And there's some nuance here. Just don't email me, okay? Just give me some room here. There are three, three primary economic systems. There is capitalism, there's communism, socialism, and then there is uh, the kingdom of God. And all three of those, those economic systems ask the same question. They ask, whose money is it? Capitalism asks the question, whose money is it? And they say, it's my money. I earned it, I get to keep it. Socialism and communism, basically the same thing, 
Again, there's some nuances there, but they're asking whose money is it? And they say, it's the people's money. And so distribute the money. And then the kingdom of God asks the question, whose money is it? And the kingdom of God answers, it's the Lord's. So do with it as he directs. Now, here's the thing. There's a complaint that will, I've been doing this a long time. There is a complaint that will rise up out of an immature Christian heart to say, I'm not giving. Like, I'm not giving 10%. Are you kidding me? There is no way I'm going to do that. And the Lord's just gently, he's just like, all of it's mine. If I, if I want 90%, I'll, I'll take 90% from you. But he, he's generous and he's kind and he's patient. And he's like, all of it is mine. Every bit of it. In fact, the NIV application commentary says it this way. It says it about this passage. I love this. They say, it is therefore more surprising that Paul's word choices in describing the collection is derived from devotion to God and sacred acts of worship, and none make, the, make any direct mention of money. Here's what they're saying. They're saying, it's so weird because Paul, and he does do this, but they're like, it's so weird. As he's talking about money, he's not talking about money. He's using all of this Old Testament language, and he's like, when we give money, it is akin to the Old Testament saints going into the temple and just pouring out their heart in extravagance to the Lord. He's like, that's what happens when we give out of a heart of worship. They go on and they say this, I love this. Any application of Paul's thoughts on giving must therefore emphasize and be convinced of Paul's theological justification for giving. Meaning, why is he talking about giving? He says, otherwise, or the the writers say, otherwise people will quickly detect that any admonitions to give, meaning any challenge to give is nothing more than a thinly veiled plea for money. So let, let me just, let me get this out on the floor. All of our giving is is firstly between us and the Lord. Make no mistake about that. But at the very same time, our very private personal giving has got to have a very public expression. Otherwise, it's not real. He goes on, he says this, verse 9, he says, For you know the, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich. Now, prosperity gospel scoundrels, they love to use this verse in a different way. I'm not going to use that. I'm not going to misapply it. I'm going to teach this the right way today. But li- listen to this. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. So my, my, here's, here's what Paul's saying. There are different ways to motivate people. Do you guys know that? Any, anybody ever been to a timeshare presentation? <laughs> and you're sitting through like, a, you know, manipulation and tactics and like guilt trips just so you can get the $50 gift card to Outback, <laughs> you know? And, and they're like convincing you like, sell your soul so you can get two weeks at Orange Beach, right? Listen, the, Paul, Paul's motivation is not guilt. He never, ever uses a manipulative technique. He's not going to put a a little homeless girl up on the screen and be like, you should give. I mean, she's going to go poor. She's going to go hungry. Like, he doesn't use those tactics. Do you know Paul's only motivation in you and I learning to give, learning to be generous? He's like, I want you to be like Jesus. Because Jesus is a giver. In fact, Paul... He's so generous. He's so much more generous and kind than I am because Paul's like, and I know you want to give because you have a new heart. You have the heart of Jesus. And so, of course, I know you want to give. So learn to give because Jesus gave it all. Think about this. Jesus was, was not a calculated giver. Do you guys know what I mean by that? Meaning Jesus did not sit in heaven going, I'm not sure I want to give you my grace because I'm not sure how you're going to steward it. He's like, I'm going to give you my grace and I know some of you are absolutely going to trample on it. He's like, but I'm an extravagant giver because that's who, who I am. And he's like, and Paul's like, and that's the heart that God has put inside of you. If you're new, if you're redeemed, if, if the, the Bible would call it, if you're regenerate, meaning you were dead and now you are alive, God's given you a heart to know him and make him known through your money. In fact, I remember years ago, um, this, is, this is 30 years ago, this is probably before I was married, this was before I was married. 
uh, I think it was maybe my first mission trip. And I, 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 we went down to Mexico, first time out of the country. And uh, we're walking through this village. And uh, I'm with some, some guys that have been doing this a long time. And the, this pastor who was in this little village had led this couple to the Lord. And uh, he's like, let's go visit them. And so uh, we, we walk in, there's this, this, a little house. And, and by house, I mean, it, it, that's a generous term. It was like scraps of wood and garbage strapped together. And it smelled. And so we walk in, I'm, I'm like the youngest guy in this little crew. And we walk in and the, the couple who is like new, new believers, they're there at this little table. And they, they brought this like dirty chipped plate out and there was an egg and a, some fruit on it. And it was an offering for the missionaries. It was, a, it was a, a gift for those bringing the word of God. And the pastor was like, they, they want you to eat it. And so I was like, okay, so we, we start eating, we split it up, we eat, start eating it. And, but I, I'm, I'm noticing along with the others, like they're not eating. And so one of the team asked the pastor, like, how come they're not eating? And he's like, oh, well, they're going without to provide for you. Like they won't eat for a couple days because they wanted to bring an offering to you on behalf of the Lord. Now I'll tell you that, that's 30 years ago. I, since then, I've held big checks in my hand, but I've never seen generosity like that, never. Because if you're wealthy and you strike a check, that doesn't mean anything to you. But when you give out of your poverty, that becomes an offering to the Lord and to others. Okay, here's how I wanna transition, I'm gonna finish. Um, Whenever you, whenever you and I see um, something happening in the world, like when, whenever something big, positive is happening in the world, and whenever you see something like really beautiful happening in the church, here's, here's what you should know. There's always somebody in the shadows that is funding that. Do you know that? Anything that is going up, anything that, any initiative happening, it's always because somebody in the shadows is funding it, no matter what. Um, in fact, when, when people say to me, and this, this, this happens from time to time, when I talk to young Christians or when I talk to Christians who have not learned to give yet, and when you ha when the longer you don't give, the more you shore up reasons not to give. And when I tell people, one of the, the reasons people give often is, um, is like, why, why would I give? I mean, like, why, why, don't, why don't we just do, why don't we handle our money the way Jesus handled our money? Which is a straw man argument. And I'm like, well, how, how do you think Jesus handled his money. And usually I get, I get some silence. And the answer to that is, you know how Jesus handles money? Do you know, like Jesus, somebody else funded Jesus' ministry. Do you guys know that? G, look, let me show you. Acts, or excuse me, Luke chapter eight. More specifically, rich women funded Jesus' ministry. So all the ladies in the house, give me a whoop, okay? <laughs> rich women funded Jesus' ministry. Luke 8, verse 1, after this, Jesus traveled about from town to town, village to village, uh, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The 12 were with him and also some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons come out. Joanna, the wife of Husa, the, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were help, helping to support them out of their own means. So it's not like Jesus like walked along the beach and he's like, sand become coin you know like no he goes to the ladies and he's like um me and the boys we're, we're going on a preaching tour a, a teaching healing tour and and how much how much you're able to give so that we can know how far we can go right I mean can you imagine meeting Susanna I mean she's, she's listed here she's she's remembered for eternity can you imagine meeting Susanna in heaven and she's just like hey did you like the gospels me and the ladies, we funded that. <laughs> She's like, did you like that little preaching tour? She's like, brought to you by Susanna. <laughs> right? You know, you know why? Because Jesus had gospel patrons. Like Jesus had people funding his ministry for the sake of the kingdom of God. 
People funded it 2,000 years ago, and that's the reason you're sitting here today. I mean, uh, Luke and Acts, uh, written by the same guy named Luke. Theologians usually put those two together, Luke Acts. And do you know how Luke and Acts probably got here? How we got that document? Somebody funded it. Probably a guy named Theophilus, who those, those, those two letters are written to. He's like, dear Theophilus. And that guy funded the, the journey that was required for Luke to record all of that. Um, Phoebe in the scripture. Anybody hear of Phoebe in the New Testament? You'll read about her in, in Romans. Phoebe, she's this beloved person to Paul. So beloved, she's the one that carried the letter of Romans to Rome. And Paul writes about her. He says this about her. He says, he says, I, I want to I thank her because she was a patron for me and for many others. So we, we need gospel patrons. I get that language, gospel patrons, from this book. And I, this is a book that, that I read uh, a few weeks ago, getting ready for these two weeks. I would encourage every person in our house to read this book. Um, I, I, every Christian needs to read this book. If you can't afford this book, it's like $10. You can go on the website. You can download the PDF for free. That's how much they want you to read it. But it's a reminder that the way gospel things get done is by gospel patrons, by people embracing the mission of God and utilizing their resources to see it move forward. If Jesus needed gospel patrons, then Hope City and every church in our city needs gospel patrons. We need faithful people that are passionate about his mission. Let me tell you a couple of stories out of this book that I, I love. Uh, anybody read their, their, the Bible in English today? Anybody read it in English? Okay, well, you can thank a, a young guy in his 20s, a guy named William Tyndale, that years ago in the late 1500s, he had a vision for getting the Bible translated into English. Up to that point, the Bible could, was only in Latin and the church, for whatever stupid reason, made it illegal to translate it into a common language. But, but William Tyndale got the vision. He's like, man, if we can get the word of God into the common man's hands, things will change. And so this wealthy businessman, a guy named Monmouth, he, he comes along and says, I'll fund it. I'll fund the translation, which took years, and then I'll pay every, I'll, I'll spend all of my money to print Bibles. And so that's what he did for the next six or seven years, translated the Bible with his funding, printed thousands upon thousands of Bibles, got into the hands of the common man in England. And the moment that the word of God was made available, revival broke out, which is not surprising. And it cost Monmouth everything, and it cost William Tyndale his life. One of my favorites is uh, the story of this true story of Lady Huntington and George Whitfield. This is a, a story of a, a wealthy uh, widow. She lived in London. This is in the 1800s. And uh, George Whitfield, I, I wrote a paper about him years ago in a seminary class. And Whitfield, he, he's recorded in the 1800s of preaching the gospel to 10 million people. And so Lady Huntington, who was a passionate follower of Jesus, she wrote a letter to Whitfield and she said, um, I love that you, you, you love the poor. I love that you're preaching the gospel to the poor because that's where he was doing it. And she's like, but would you come and preach the gospel to my rich friends? She's like, because I got a lot of rich friends. And so she, she proposed what, what in England they call these salons, these house parties. Everybody, anybody have a house party? She had a big mansion. She's like, I'm gonna invite all my friends, the most elite people in London. And would you just come and preach? So he's like, yeah, I'm coming. So he shows up and Literally, members of parliament are there. The wealthiest people in England are at that party. And I love this. This just shows you like the boldness of George Whitfield. I, just, I, I, I have a little bit of that. I want a little bit of this. George Whitfield, a hundred of the wealthiest elite people in England are in the house. And, and his first sermon is how the, it's easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle <laughs> than for rich people to get into heaven. But listen to what he said. This is his part of his sermon. He said, I've got a vision for you. He said, my vision is I want to break off a false dependence on what you see and give you a deeper dependence on what you don't see. And for many of you, listen, the reason you don't give is because you need deliverance. 
You need deliverance from the power of mammon over your life. Of control. But ultimately, many of you, you just need a bigger vision for what God's doing in your life and wants to do in your life.